Peripheral devices. A peripheral in PC hardware terminology refers to electronic equipment that's connected by cable to the main case of the computer. In other words, the device is attached to the host computer, but not permanently a part of it, so it's more or less dependent upon the host. In this nugget, we'll look at common peripheral devices, and then we'll turn to an important phase of output, the various types of printers that are used in information technology in the 21st century. Let's begin. The first type of peripheral device we'll look at are the cams. By cam we refer to digital cameras as well as webcams or web cameras. As previously discussed, these devices are traditionally cabled to your computer via a universal serial bus version 2 external connection. Digital cameras come in two main varieties. What you see over in the upper right here is an example of a point-and-shoot digital camera, the Sony CyberShot. These can give you pretty high-resolution pictures with a minimum of configuration. To tie in what we learned in the previous nugget, digital cameras store those digital images on some type of flash memory card, some removable card. Pretty universally now is the SD format, as previously discussed. When purchasing a digital camera, you'll want to look at several aspects. One is the megapixel rating. The higher the number of megapixels, mega by the way is a prefix that refers to millions, so 8.1 million pixels, means that you can generate larger pictures. Remember when we talked about computer monitor resolution, we talked about pixels there in terms of the number of pixels across times the number of pixels down. Well, a map of, in this case, 8 million pixels is going to give you a lot of detail in those pictures as well as detail spread over a much larger area. So you could probably do poster size prints pretty easily with this CyberShot camera. Another purchasing decision, and I know that this isn't a digital camera or digital photography course you're taking, is what kind of zoom the device has. Is it digital? Is it analog? Is it both? The actual analog zoom gives you true magnification, whereas digital zoom is kind of a cheat method to give you zoom. The high-end digital cameras that professional photographers use nowadays, the single lens reflex or SLR type, these look like the old film SLR but they're all digital. What are webcams used for? Well, webcams are used both in business and in residential environments. In residential environments, you might use a webcam to do video chat with family and friends. In business, I've used webcam for video conferencing using services like Cisco's WebEx. I mean, it's one thing to be doing a teleconference on the telephone. It's another thing to actually see your colleague's face. External webcams, again, just like digital cameras connect to the main CPU or the main box of your system via USB traditionally. Also, especially this is true in laptop computers and higher-end desktop computer monitors, you may have a webcam integrated in the bezel or outer border of the display. For instance, I have two Dell LCD widescreen displays on my desk right now, and each of those monitors has a bezel-mounted webcam. I also have a couple laptops. Both of those have bezel-mounted webcams. Webcams. Now the resolution, again, the pixel depth that you're going to get with those webcams in most cases isn't particularly good, but then again with webcams, whether they're used in business or for residential use, you're not looking for ultra high crisp definition. Webinars are actually another nice case for using a webcam, teaching over the internet or possibly a local area network. Let's go out onto the web. I've done a search for webcams and Logitech is a pretty key manufacturer of these things, you notice that some of them come in some pretty weird form factors. You have some humor here, just like earlier when I showed you computer cases and some of the humor that's involved with those. Now this is an interesting compromise. This shows a, looks like an Apple MacBook laptop, but it actually has a bezel-mounted removable webcam. Normally when a webcam is integrated in the bezel of a computer, it just looks like basically a little black dot or a little black hole right here in the upper center of that bezel. Doing a search for digital SLR cameras, you can see that these look identical to the true film SLRs that I know I grew up with in the 70s and 80s. However, the circuitry, the output, is all digital. So you have some kind of removable flash memory card inside, just like you do with a point-and-shoot digital camera. Of course, the price point is going to be higher for these SLRs because they give you a much wider range of configuration options. 
and they're just simply more powerful with these big ol' lenses. Our previous discussion of what a peripheral device is gets a little bit murky when we start getting into things like audio interfaces or sound cards, because dollars to donuts, these sound cards will be at least semi-permanently snapped into an expansion slot on your computer's motherboard. However, I guess we could customize our definition by referring to sound cards as an internal peripheral device, because certainly the computer is still freestanding and functional with no audio. You just don't have that benefit. All right, so an audio interface is also referred to as a sound card by most IT professionals, and this is simply circuitry that gives the computer the ability to process sound. It's as simple as that. When you install an audio interface on a computer, you're going to also need to install an associated driver. Not sure we formally defined this term yet. A driver is software that's used to give your operating system specific instructions on how to use that newly installed hardware. It's as simple as that. And the best practice is, although you might purchase a new audio interface in box and it gives you the card as well as say a CD that includes the driver, best practice is to go out to the vendor's website and download the most recent version of that driver because chances are the copy of the driver that's on that CD is out of date with what's current. Connection interfaces for a sound card include USB if it's an X external audio interface. Internal, we have PCIe and PCI. These are both variant slot types that are found in contemporary computers. They're multi-purpose. You can put different types of peripheral cards in PCIe and PCI slots, like video, network, audio, and so on. And then also for external use, you have the Firewire or 802.13.94 type connector. Again, we'll talk more about these components specifically later in the course. Besides just having the circuitry to process audio output and potentially audio input as well if you're using a microphone, we need to have a speaker in place somehow to be able to observe that audio. Speakers can be internal or external. Examples of internal speakers would be all-in-one systems, like you remember the iMac I showed you earlier, where you have a bass and a big old thin monitor that has everything, the motherboard, peripherals, everything, all within a single unit, and sure enough, there are speakers in there as well. More commonly in desktop computing environments, though, you're not going to get much performance with internal speakers. They're tinny, so we'll want to go with an external solution. We could have just your traditional single pair of dynamic range speakers, or you could get jiggy with it and go for a surround sound system that involves subwoofers, tweeters, etc. With respect to audio input, microphone for instance, you might want to do chat over the internet, you might want to record screencast video for educational purposes and business. Business. I mean, that's what I'm doing right now for CBT Nuggets. In this case, you'll need some form of input to that sound card or that audio interface. We'll look at the specific ports on a sound card in just a moment. When you're plugging in a microphone to a sound card, you can do that a couple different ways. For an external device, you can use a line-in or a mic jack. And as far as the microphones themselves, there's all sorts of possibilities. On the low end of the quality and cost scale, you have the USB headset you've probably used look something like this. You've got the ear cups or earphones and then you've got a flexible conduit for lack of a better term with a little dynamic microphone on the end. Condenser are higher end microphones. They tend to just have action on one side of them so you're going to need to stay in front of that condenser at all times but I found that condenser microphones tend to give me really good results both for recording voice as well as instruments. Speaking of condenser microphones, this is an example of one right here. You'll notice that it tends to use what's called a capsule form factor, and the principle of the condenser mic as opposed to the omnidirectional that you might have seen, the one with the ball on the end that can accept input from pretty much th almost 360 degrees, if not 360 degrees around the mic. Condensers are unidirectional, so you need to be careful of mic placement. This particular condenser is shown in what's called a shock mount that keeps the microphone suspended so that you don't get unwanted noise if, for instance, you jiggle the microphone stand. The connector that comes out of of higher end microphones, whether they're dynamic or condenser, is what's called the XLR 
jack or XLR connector. The difference between a male and female end of any connector you might recall is that the male has the pins, the female has the holes. One gotcha that you as an IT sales representative need to be aware of is if your customer has need for a higher end microphone that uses XLR, you're going to need to match up that hardware with appropriate audio devices that have those inputs. You see what I mean? I mean, look below. This is traditionally what you see on a low to mid-range desktop computer that has, for instance, an integrated sound card, integrated right into the motherboard. These represent the lowest end of the audio quality scale, and traditionally you use these little mini 8th inch connectors, and they're color-coded, which is completely worthless to people like me who are colorblind. I've always had a pet peeve about audio connections on desktop PCs because of the color-coded nature. And the other complaint that I've had, and I'm just complaining here, I hope you don't mind, is that the besides the color coding, you have little graphics that tell you what's what, but I found them to be kind of cryptic, and you tend to have to get down on your hands and knees with a flashlight and get behind the computer if it's behind the customer customer's desk or the user's desk to figure out which port is which. It's just kind of a universal problem. Now this first jack, this 8th inch mini jack, is going to be for input, isn't it? It's going to be for microphones. And then look at these. They're labeled in and out. I've seen them also without any text. But what you want to look at with these graphics is the direction of the arrow. The arrow going into the sound graphic icon, or whatever you want to call that, means that this is a line in. You can also plug a mic into line in if you want to, or if you have a keyboard or some other device that has the 8th inch jack on it, you can put it in here to bring sound into the computer. As far as hooking the computer to your speakers, there you're taking sound that's originating from inside the box out, so you would use the 1 8th inch jack to go out of this port. Now as I said, if you have XLR or other types of connections, RCA, digital, then you're going to need a higher end audio interface. And you can purchase PCI audio interfaces that have just about every kind of input or output jack under the sun, or alternatively you can go for an external solution like this one here, the M-Audio Audio File USB. It connects into your computer via a USB jack, and it gives you some flexibility in as much as you can keep this on your desk and see everything that's going on instead of having to, like I said, get down on your hands and knees, get behind the computer. And you also see that you have a nice plethora of connections. Here we have some XLR connect. Actually, these are MIDI connections on the front. The MIDI connector at first blush looks kind of like the XLR. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Device Interface, and that's traditionally what you'll use to put in MIDI-capable devices like keyboards and sequencers and so forth. In fact, this is an older audiophile USB. I have a newer model, I'm actually recording on it right now, that does have XLR inputs on it. This one evidently doesn't. But you get the general idea. I think now you have a better clue on what's going on with regard to audio interfaces. Now, as far as internal audio interfaces, I told you that as you go up the scale in price and quality, you get more flexibility. That same company that makes the external box I showed you has a line of internal PCI cards called the Audiophile sound cards. And as you see here, because there's not enough room on the back of the card to give you all of these inputs and outputs, what they do and by they I mean the manufacturer M-Audio gives you this breakout connector here and then on the end of that pigtail or ponytail, I guess it is, you have a whole collection of different input and output ports. So it looks kind of messy at first blush. You've got this great big dangling ponytail, but you know, that's the way we do business in higher quality audio. Something else you'll see on mid to high level audio, especially with the Sound Blaster type cards, is that you'll have the best of both worlds. That is to say, you'll have the internal PCI or PCIe card, which you see here on the right, and then you have what's formally called as a breakout box that in many cases uses the five and a quarter inch form factor and can therefore be slid into one of your optical drive bays on the front of your computer. So this gives the best of both 
both worlds in as much as you're going to get less latency or delay and typically better performance when you're using an audio interface that's physically socketed or snapped into an expansion slot on your motherboard as opposed to using USB 2 external boxes. So not only do you have that, but the breakout box gives you, again, ease of access, being able to twiddle the knobs and make setting changes without having to get down on your hands and knees behind the computer. So that's the breakout box. Printers certainly qualify for peripheral devices, don't they? The main computer can exist in isolation from a printer. However, you and I both know that the joy and convenience of being able to do print output is a very good thing indeed. As we know, a printer, formerly called a print device, is an output device with output form factors being paper, you can print photos, you can print directly to fax or scan, lots of different ways to do this. Connection types used in printers. Now, historically, printers several years ago used a really clunky, slow connection called the parallel port. In fact, new computers nowadays are entirely absent from the parallel port. However, it used to be pretty ubiquitous because it was, as I said, before USB, the chief way to connect a printer. Really clunky interface, very slow, as I said. USB, as you see, has been used a lot of different ways thus far in the course. We can use USB to connect audio peripherals, printers, digital cameras, camcorders, webcams. This is why the technology is called the universal serial bus. It's a single connector type that can be co-opted for use with various peripheral devices. In business, though, it's largely impractical to physically cable a print device to each computer. It's not cost-effective, it's harder to maintain from an IT management point of view, and it's just unnecessary. So remember when we talked about Ethernet, both the 802.3 three wired Ethernet standard and the 802.11 wireless standard? Well, in business, and now the prices come down to where network printing is even available for home users, what we have are print devices that have built-in network connectivity. That is to say, these printers have their own network interface card, or NIC as they're called by those of us in the industry, that provides, again, either the wired connection to your network backbone or possibly a little antenna and wireless access. Back in between the parallel port days, the dark ages of printers, and the ubiquity of USB and Ethernet connections, for a while there, printer manufacturers were using infrared. This is a very short-range, line-of-sight wireless technology that largely failed when put up against Bluetooth, which we discovered earlier. You can actually find Bluetooth printers to do short-term, short-range wireless work there. But infrared was a technology, at least with respect to printing, that I thought was doomed right at the start. How often are your computer cases going to have a line-of-sight with your printer? It's just too easy to put a garbage can or something in between the two and then louse up your print jobs. Back to the notion of network printing. When we're putting a print device on the local area network for use by more than one user, it's presumed that we want to share that print queue to distribute print load and to give many people the opportunity to use the features of that device. We need to think in terms of who or what is providing the print server service. Now, as previously discussed in an earlier nugget, when we introduced the concept of the server, the print server can actually be dedicated within the printer itself, or you can offload administration of a network-enabled printer to a server computer. It's up to you on how you want to do this. In my experience, as your network grows in size and you wind up deploying more and more network printers, it makes sense to manage them from a server computer running, say, Microsoft Windows Server 2008, than it does to visit each one of these devices individually and configure its sharing and print server settings right there using the printer's own software. IT managers tend to want to do as much work as possible remotely from the comfort of their desk. Okay, that's a point to ponder as an IT sales representative. So in my experience, although 
any mid to high quality network printer will have the ability to do print serving on its own. You tend to want to aggregate those print queues and manage them on a server computer instead. Before I show you some pretty pictures, let's take a look at the main varieties or types of printers. Now I was going to say all of these are in use today in 2010, and actually that's true. It wasn't all that long ago that I worked as a director of technology for a school where, sure enough, some dot matrix printers were in use. Dot matrix is the original printer type. I mean, we're talking about barely letter quality. Many dot matrix printers were not capable of what is called letter quality type. Letter quality at that time being compared to the output you'd get from a, wait for it, typewriter. How many of you remember using electric or even manual typewriters? Anyway, the higher end dot matrix printers do provide almost near letter quality if letter quality output. However, these things are so difficult to configure. They historically have been and continue to be. If you can even get a dot matrix printer to run with a current computer, my hat's off to you. You tend to use what's called form feed or perforated paper with these. So you've got a tray or a stand with your dot matrix printer and then you have a tray that you'll need to set up that has the form feed paper that feeds into the dot matrix and then when the paper comes out in just this long string it's up to you to cut at the perforation lines. You also have to trim the sides off because you tend to have the daisy wheel holes in the perforated print paper that pulls the paper through the dot matrix mechanism. The actual way that ink is transferred to the paper is very similar to that of a typewriter. You literally have the page, then you have an ink ribbon, then you have the print head, which is literally a collection of dots little metal, kind of like a tattoo needle when you think about it, a cluster of dots that dynamically changes to represent each letter or number that you need on your output. The higher end dot matrix printers had more pins, maybe it was a 24 pin dot matrix, so the print head had a denser collection of pins and was therefore capable of producing sharper letters and numbers and non-alphanumeric characters. Dot matrix is, like I said, an interesting historical sidelight, but it's largely a dinosaur now in information technology, thank heaven. Next up we have Inkjet, which is pretty much the de facto go-to printer for residential or home users. I tend to not see much Inkjet in use in business unless it's a special purpose inkjet printer that's used for photo printing or maybe in drafting etc. The inkjet printer, the principle there is that you have these nozzles that literally spray the ink onto the paper. It's quite amazing how the technology works. And the price for these bad boys has come down so much to where you can purchase a USB inkjet printer for under a hundred dollars that's capable of very high quality black text printing, color text printing, and even full color photo printing. But, and this is the crime in my personal opinion, the price for consumables for inkjets is just astronomical. You wind up paying next to nothing for the hardware, but boy they get you when it comes time to replace those little ink bottles. To that end, especially some price conscious or money conscious home users tend to work out ways to refill those ink bottles on their own. There's actually a business model in place. Maybe in your city you have a store to where you can return and recycle your ink bottles and get them refilled there for a much smaller amount of money. The standard go-to printer type in business is the laser printer. Now if you want to become a CompTIA A plus certified computer repair technician you'll have to understand the laser printing process. But all we need to know in terms of the strata certificate objectives is that laser printers give us super high quality output. They're fast. The principle behind the ink transfer or in the case of laser printing it's not ink but tiny little particles called toner. The device uses an actual laser beam to etch the toner and transfer it from a magnetically charged metal drum that turns inside the laser printer and then transfers the toner and fuses it to the paper in black and white and color. Laser printers are certainly capable of color printing nowadays and when you hear a laser printer warm up you can hear the whirring and the turning and that's that magnetized cylinder to which toner gets affixed and then charged and ultimately transferred and fused to the paper as I said. 
Finally, we have thermal printing. This uses heat to transfer wax, dye, could be actually old school ink ribbon, a lot of different ways to actually transfer the material to the paper. Thermal printers are used a lot with point of sale or POS systems, maybe in libraries. You know, receipt printers are good examples of thermal printers. Other specialty purposes of thermal printers include ultrasound. Remember I mentioned a moment ago that network printers are the de rigueur standard in business. That's true. Increasingly, though, businesses are turning to renting, perhaps purchasing, but in many cases renting a big old multifunction device and then installing one of these behemoths on a per department basis. Sometimes these multifunction devices, which are all Ethernet enabled, they're on the network, are referred to as work group devices because they're devoted to a particular department or group of employees. Nice things about these multifunction devices is that you get your printing, but not only that, many of the multifunction work group printers will do finishing as well. Now what does that mean? Finishing would be like three hole punching. It would be like collating and stapling. Things that can save people a lot of time, especially those in education. Teachers who need to print out their handouts for their students. It's really nice to be able to give them a finished product. We're going to talk about duplexing more when we cover green IT later in the course, but duplexing simply refers to printing on both sides of the page. This immediately gives us a 50% reduction in the paper required per print job. I'm a big fan of duplex printing myself. Multifunction devices, by virtue of their network enabled status enable you to do things like faxing and scanning and in particular doing page scans such that the printer will email those page images to you directly really convenient way to do business and as I said earlier when I mentioned the business model that's sprung up among inkjet recyclers there are many companies that go into business doing nothing other than leasing these big old multifunction devices and taking care of the upkeep. So many IT departments consider this a turnkey solution in as much as they can save money having to purchase these things and instead rent them and then have a contract with the vendor such that the vendor comes out to pick up toner cartridges. Toner cartridges are almost always recyclable to drop off filled toner, to make maintenance stops, etc. It's a nice thing to do. Now what about scanning? Scanning can be done either on a per computer basis with a personal flatbed scanner connected using USB or Firewire, or to tie things into the multifunction device you could have a flatbed scanner built in there that gives you output to email, to PDF, to TIFF image, etc. By the way, before we go on, please note that multifunction devices are available for the consumer as well. You can go to Dell or you can go to bestbuy.com and do a search for multifunction printer and you can get all-in-one devices. That's traditionally what they're called in the consumer market, all-in-ones, that give you all of these Maybe not finishing or duplexing, but certainly give you the printing, the faxing, and the scanning all in a single integrated unit using, say, inkjet or potentially laser technology. Back to scanning, some of the things we want to look at when selecting scanners and proposing them to our customers and clients are things like resolution, pixels again. How many pixels is the scanner capable of gathering? You might have graphic artists who need to scan in full high resolution photos. They would have a different different requirement in a scanner from say someone who works in a medical records office and is digitizing print forms that are simply black and white with lots and lots of text. Speed is another factor. Originally scanners used that old archaic parallel port technology just like the original printers did. Therefore the devices were abysmally slow. However now with USB firewire and ethernet as well as advances in the scanning circuitry within the hardware, the speed's really taken a really big boost. But that's another metric that you want to look at when comparing scanners. Finally, we have text recognition. This is especially helpful for businesses that are moving to the electronic office. That is to say, we may have copy, print copy, that we need digitized, not just for archival purposes. If we just were archiving them, then we could scan these to the Adobe Acrobat Portable Document Format, or PDF, and store them that way. But in some cases, we need to scan documents and actually make edits to the text. 
Therefore, we have what's called OCR being a pretty big technology with scanners. It stands for Optical Character Recognition, also called Text Recognition. OmniPage Pro has been the market leader in this technology for a long time, but there are a lot of competition out there, and the accuracy of the text recognition has gotten so much better than it was even a handful of years ago. Let's take a look at some pictures now. I mentioned that dot matrix printers have a variety of form factors, almost all archaic. This is an image from Dell showing it looks like an Epson model dot matrix printer. And as you see, you have a manual page advance knob here. You edge guides for bringing the pages in, printer cover, front cover. It looks at first blush like a larger inkjet printer, but remember the technology is so much different. This is showing you the arrangement of dots or pins in a dot matrix printer and then how some of those pins are activated or pushed out farther basically and then pressed against the ink ribbon to give you the printed result of the, in that case, the capital letter B. Here's an Okadata dot matrix printer and you can see the form fed paper there with the carriage dots. This has a great big handle on the side to manually advance your paper. Moving on to inkjets, you probably already know what inkjet printers look like. They're so ubiquitous, but I thought this was useful to show you that inkjet technology can really take a big step up. And what I mean by that is, depending upon your needs, you can purchase these large format inkjets that are literally half as big as a room and be able to print poster size output. Now, of course, these are not cheap, but in drafting, architectural houses, professional photography studios, it can be helpful. Here's an all-in-one inkjet that shows you, well, a flatbed scanner. It looks like this may be a duplexing tray, I'm not sure. And there's probably fax in there as well, besides just standard printing. This is a good example of an all-in-one that you'd find at a home or a small office, home office environment. Thermal printers, as I said, are used quite a bit for receipt printing or point of sale application. So these are some simple examples. The receipt page is in there on a spool and the way that the thermal process works depends a little bit on the vendor but gives you much better output than dot matrix printers, that's for sure. Here's another page of large format printers, just enormous printers that could be used to even print images that comprise billboards, let's say. Although, frankly, billboards have largely gone digital now, aren't they? Finally, let's look at some multifunction workgroup printers. These are the stand-up guys that you can find in a departmental office. So you'd put these in a public office or some publicly accessible area and they can do pretty much anything under the sun if you're willing to pay the price for them that is. Our final subject in this nugget is what I call television stuff. In other words, how do we link up a computer with a television signal? PC to TV connection. Well, the main way to do this is to purchase a peripheral card called a TV tuner. You see an example of this over here on the right. You notice the copper connectors. You're going to use typically the PCI slot type there to mount this card in your chassis, install your driver, and what this will give you is the ability to obtain TV signals into your PC. You notice the coaxial connectors here? So you would take a coax cable coming from a wall port where you're getting your signal from your television service provider and then along with your associated software you can turn your computer into a full-fledged media center and turn your computer really into what's called a DVR or digital video recorder. Now strictly speaking a DVR is also called a set-top box in which your TV content is always being saved to an internal hard drive. That is to say we could be watching live TV and pause it, rewind, and review in slow motion what we just watched. It's pretty cool. DVRs are largely been subsumed into the cable television industry. For instance, I subscribe to Comcast Digital Cable and I have one of their set-top boxes, actually a couple of them, and they have an integrated DVR with, I don't remember how many hours of recording you get, but I'm sure that's expandable to a degree. But that set-top box gives me everything I need as far as being able to tune the stations and then do your DVR recording, reviewing, erasing, all that kind of stuff. Now, I used to be a TiVo subscriber. There are, again, format wars, format wars, format wars. There used to be a few players in this space. Now it's pretty much just TiVo left. 
who make their own set-top boxes, they have the advantage, TiVo does in my experience, of giving you a much better user interface or UI. I've used Time Warner Cable's DVR, I've used Comcast. Their UI or user interface is almost uniformly horrible. Whereas TiVo is very intuitive, very slick, you can generally get capacity that's far better than what you get from your cable TV company but there's an extra subscription charge on top of your cable bill for paying for TiVo service. Now how do you tune the stations if you're using a separate set-top box? Well there's a couple ways to do that. You could just daisy chain using coax cable from your Comcast, your Time Warner, your Rogers, whoever does your cable TV into the TiVo. That's one way to do it. Nowadays though the latest thing to do is to simply request one or two cable cards from your cable TV provider. That's what this guy is down here in the lower right. It looks like a little thicker credit card. Slide those into your DVR, your TiVo, your third-party DVR and that will give you your tuning ability and then you could take over from there with the actual set top box operating system. I've done a Google image search for DVR here. Let's see. I'm seeing a lot of different vendors but I'm not even seeing TiVo. Isn't that interesting? Uh, there's a TiVo. No it's not. That's a Dish Network satellite tuner. Tell you what, why don't we do a search for Comcast DVR, show you what those look like. This is actually a good picture that shows you the Comcast DVR and the TiVo unit side by side. They're really not all that much to look at, quite honestly. They're just your traditional set-top boxes. TiVo kind of takes the Apple approach in giving you more aesthetic appeal. You have the so-called peanut remote control, nice form factor to the box that glows and so on, whereas your Comcast or your digital cable provider is going to give you a supposedly functional box. Note that I'm a little snarky here. Supposedly functional, but not all that much to look at. Peripheral Devices Review. In this nugget we defined what a peripheral device is and we took a look at mostly external but in some cases internal peripherals, things like sound cards, digital cameras, webcams, etc. Then we looked at printing, we looked at the types of printer, dot matrix, inkjet laser, we looked at some purchasing points, especially useful information for you to have if you're for instance working as a systems integrator in IT sales. And then left off this bullet point is some TV stuff where I showed you about a TV TV tuner card that turns your personal computer into a full-fledged media center, as well as set-top boxes called DVRs. I hope that this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.